Today I'd like to tell um, some stories about um, the principles that demonstrate some of the principles of the local living economy movement that we're engaged in at Bali. And we call them living economies because they're economies that support both uh, natural life and community life as well as long-term uh, economic life. So during the time uh, that I ran the White Dog Cafe, I had a sign in my closet. When I opened my closet in the morning, I would see each day that said, good morning, beautiful business. And it was a reminder to me of just how beautiful business is when we put our energy and our care and our creativity into producing a, a product or a service that our community needs. Economic exchange can be one of the most meaningful um, exchanges uh, among humans. When I saw that sign, Good Morning Beautiful Business, I would also think of my own business and how the farmers were out in the fields picking organic fruits and vegetables uh, to bring into town that day. And I would think of the farm animals out on fresh air and sunshine, the, the goats, the pigs, the cows. And I would think of our uh, goat herder, Dougie. She said when she kissed her goat's ears, it made the cheese better. Uh, I think that's true. I would think of our bakers coming in early in the morning to put uh, bread and pies and cakes in the oven for our customers that day. And I would think about the Zapatista Indians down in Chiapas uh, making the organic, or growing the organic fair trade beans uh, that I would enjoy in my morning cup of coffee. Business is about relationships. Money is only a tool. Business is about the relationships with everyone that we buy from and sell to and do business with, uh, work with, and it's about a relationship with Earth itself. And for me, my business was the way that I expressed my love of life, uh, and that's what made it a thing of beauty. After helping to save um, a row of Victorian brownstone row houses in Philadelphia from demolition uh, that was to make way for a mall of chain stores and fast food restaurants, um, I was able to buy my house and started uh, the White Dog Cafe on the first floor uh, in 1983. I lived in that house and cared for that community for almost 40 years. Choosing a place, getting to know that place, taking responsibility for that place is the first step uh, in building a local living economy. So like the family farm or the family run in or the corner store, the old fashioned way, I, I lived above the business, lived above the shop, uh, and raised my family in the workplace. With industrialization, um, like in many areas, there became a separation uh, between work and family life. And I admire the, the Ms. Foundation for coming up with the program called Take Your Daughter to Work, uh, which was a way of kind of overcoming that separation between uh, work and work life and home life. And I remember when my first daughter, uh, Grace, was born uh, 32 years ago now, <laughs> um, I took her to work with me after about a week and I had her up in the office. Uh, then in, at night when I was down in the restaurant, I kept her in a basket um, in, on the uh, top of the baby grand piano. And after the first day of work, I closed up the restaurant, went home, got in the bed, and think, I'm forgetting something. Oh my gosh, the baby! <laughs> and I ran back to the restaurant, unlocked the door, and found that she's still sleeping soundly in her little basket. Uh, and I realized that it was not a problem for me to bring my daughter to work, it was a problem to remember to bring her home again. <laughs> but living above the shop, uh, for me, home uh, life and work life were interwoven. So I naturally had the same value system at work uh, as at home, where business schools often uh, tell students, leave your values at home uh, when you go to work. So it's at home, you're teaching your children the golden rule, and when you're at work, gold rules. Industrialization has not only separated us from each other and from the land, but it's really separated us um, from our, our deepest values. Living and working in the same community not only gave me a stronger sense of place, but a different business outlook because I saw every day the people that were affected by my business decisions, whether it was my customers or my employees or my neighbors or uh, the man-made environment or the natural environment in which I lived. So I was more likely to make decisions from the heart as well as from the head. And this resulted in decisions I believe were uh, for the common good. And there was a short distance uh, between me as the business decision maker and those affected by my decisions. And that's another principle in the local living economy movement is to have that that short distance. When businesses grow larger and larger, that distance becomes uh, longer, and uh, there's a, such a huge diff uh, distance that some CEOs never even see those affected by their decisions. Yet business schools uh, uh, teach grow or die, that bigger is better rather than small is beautiful. And for me, um, because business success is measured in how large your business is on continual growth, I uh, for a while thought, well, am I just a big sissy because there's not a chain of white dog cafes? 
Uh, but then I realized that what was most important to my own happiness was the authenticity of the relationships that I had with everybody in my, in my business. And if I grew my business larger, that I would leave what, lose what would really make me happy. So I began to see that there were other ways to grow rather than growing physically, uh, growing my business bigger and bigger, that I could grow by deepening those relationships. I could grow by expanding my consciousness, by deepening my knowledge, by growing my community, by restoring my natural environment, by increasing well-being and, and health, by having more fun. So at the White Dog, uh, once I grew to a financially sustainable size, I stopped growing physically and started growing deeper in my own community and started begun, uh, begin, beginning to have educational programs, uh, community tours, international tours that did in fact increase um, knowledge, uh, broaden our consciousness, restore our environment, and so on. Uh, and that's another uh, principle in the local living economy movement, and that is businesses can play a role as an edu uh, in education, in educating our staff and our customers about sustainability. So at the White Dog, we took our customers on solar uh, house tours. We taught them how to do energy audits of their houses. We took them on tours to farms, to prisons, uh, on child watch tours to witness the lives of inner city children. We took them on international tours uh, to Cuba to study the community garden programs there, uh, to Chiapas to understand the roots of unrest that resulted in the Zapatista uh, uprising. We had dinner talks with speakers to create a community dialogue around issues like uh, climate change or uh, drug policy reform with speakers like Michael Schumann and David Corton and um, Francis Molope, et cetera. Uh, we had a community um, a service day and, and took 35 customers and staff down to New Orleans after Katrina to do uh, help with rebuilding. Some people claim that um, what I really do is I use, uh, I lure innocent customers with good food, uh, lure them into social activism. And I think that's true. So um, another way that we grew was uh, by growing our green uh, business model to restore the natural environment. And each uh, day around Earth Day would have a Green Dog Day, where we announced uh, a new environmental program, like uh, starting a communal uh, compost uh, center on our block with the other restaurants um, to create compost for inner city gardens, putting uh, hot water, solar hot water on a roof to wash all those dishes, etc. cetera. Uh, I've got to speed up here, because I know I'm getting short on time. So uh, in the local living economy movement, we feel like we've reinvented uh, growth. Rather than doing a cookie cutter way of uh, expanding our business into other people's neighborhoods, instead of doing a white dog in someone else's neighborhood, I look to see what does my community need uh, that they don't have now to become more self-reliant, become more sustainable, to become more, more interesting. Um, so instead of starting another white dog, I started a black cat. Um, which is a retail store that specialized in selling products made in our own local community from ceramics and glassware and uh, candles and so on. Um, and uh, uh, in her book, Dancing in the Streets, uh, Barbara Ehrenrich uh, talks about the importance of collective joy and how in our industrialized society that sometimes that's become missing um, and causing a depression. And that we've begun to think that to have a good time, we have to have a lot of money and travel far away. Uh, and a customer gave me this book because the white dog is known for dancing in the street with our many block parties. And I just wanted to uh, tell a quick story of my favorite block party, which was for the uh, 4th of July Eve, the Liberty and Justice for All Ball. And they'd have a big buffet of food from uh, local farmers. And then afterwards, we did a little skit called Birth of the Nation, where I dressed as a colonial woman that was uh, pregnant with a big beach ball under my colonial dress and a clown face and a, and a colonial bonnet. And first would come a Revolutionary War uh, soldier with his drum and up through the, the crowd. Um, then the, the midwife with her lantern, and then I would come out sort of groaning in labor pains and uh, come up to the, where there was a big bed in the middle of the street uh, with red, white, and blue decorations. And as I turned around, people could see the sign on my back that said, uh, George Washington slept here. Um, <laughs> then I'd get into my bed and get into birthing position, and my midwife would deliver my twins, a black woman and a white woman. One is liberty, the other is justice, and red, white, and blue. They'd jump onto the stage and do a tap dance to Yankee Doodle, and then would wheel out the Statue of Liberty and light our sparklers and sing God bless America. So, <laughs> building a sustainable and inclusive local economy is not just about a responsibility of future generations, but it's about connecting to our place, connecting with each other, um, and having a good time uh, creating local identity through local artists and creative entrepreneurs. And that's another pr uh, principle in the local living economy movement, and that's make it fun. Um, at, at Bali, we say it's a better party. And in our local uh, Bali network in Philadelphia, we say that we're creating the merry mecca. So there's a collective joy uh, that comes from collaboratively working together toward a shared vision. Uh, my next story is a critical turning point in my career that demonstrates um, perhaps the, the, the most key point in the local living economy movement. 
So in 1986, um, the white dog started buying from local farmers organic fruits and vegetables. I knew the importance of buying free-range chicken and eggs, but I didn't know about the atrocious way in which pigs were um, treated in our industrial system until I read John Robbins' book, Die for a New America, and found out about the mother sows kept in these crates where they can't turn around or move or take a step forward, never feel sunshine, never have a breath of fresh air, artificially inseminated, babies are taken away prematurely, artificially inseminated again, as though they're pieces of machinery. And I was outraged by this. Uh, these are sentient beings. They're mammals, like our dogs, that have the same capacity for affection and, and love and fear and so on. Um, and so I, I, I realized I just this was a violation, you know, of nature to treat these mothers in this way. And really, a betrayal of our sacred trust uh, um, for to be stewards of farm animals. So I, I just came to the kitchen and said, "Take all the pork off the menu." I, I can't believe because the pork that we must be serving uh, is coming from the system because unless you know otherwise, all the pork in this country comes from that kind of system. So uh, we took off the ham, the bacon, the pork chops, and went about uh, finding a place that had naturally raised uh, pork, which we found. And then there was the plight of the cow um, and how they need to be grass-fed, uh, moved to grass-fed uh, cows. Finally, I looked at my menu and I thought, gee, we finally done it. We have a cruelty-free menu. Um, and no other t restaurant in Philadelphia has this. This is our competitive advantage. Um, you know, this is our market niche. And then I thought to myself, well, Judy, if you really do care about those pigs, if you really care about the environmental damage of the concentration of manure that's polluting the streams and the soil and the air, if you really care about the workers in these slaughterhouses and, and factories, if you care about the uh, small farmers that are being driven out of business, if you care about the consumers that are eating this meat that's full of hormones and antibiotics, then rather than keeping this as your market niche, you'll share this information with your competitors. And that was a huge turning point in my life because I realized there's no such thing as one sustainable business that we can only be part of a sustainable system and that we have to work in cooperation in order to build that. So I said to the, to the, to the farmer who brought in our, our two pigs a week for us, would you like to expand your business? And he said, yes. And I said, what's holding you back? And he said he needed $30,000 to buy a refrigerated truck. So I loaned him the $30,000. And then I started White Dog Community Enterprises, a nonprofit, and started putting 20% of my profits into the nonprofit and started Fair Food. And Fair, Foods, uh, uh, Fair Food Philly, not to be confused with what's now the Fair Food Network, a national organization, but uh, Fair Food Philly, uh, where the employee's first job was to go around to the other restaurants and teach them how to buy from farmers. So I realized that when I came into um, the kitchen that day and said, uh, take all the, all the pork off the menu, that I was, um, I, was, I was following the teachings of Gandhi and King, which is non-cooperation with an evil system. And that is the first step in social change, because once you refuse to cooperate, you have to build a new system. And that's what we went about doing. And that's what we're doing in Bali, to build a new system that's based on cooperation and sharing. Um, so I'm running out of time here. Um, and Michael and I are going to be talking more about Bali um, in our uh, session. Um, but I uh, wanted to mention that we have our annual conference where we exchange ideas and, uh, on May 15th and to 18th in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I'm going to end by um, summarizing. But the local living economy movement is about maximizing relationships, not maximizing profits. Democracy and decentralized ownership, not concentrated wealth. A living return on our investments, not the highest return. A fair price, not the lowest price. Sharing, not hoarding. <coughs> Simplicity, not gluttony. Life serving, not self serving. Partnership, not domination. Cooperation based, not competition based. Win win exchange, not win lose exploitation. Family farms, not factory farms. Biodiversity, not monocrops. Cultural diversity, not monoculture. Creativity, not conformity. Slow food, not fast food. Arbucks, not Starbucks. Armart, not Walmart, valuing life over lifestyle, and as the Earth Charter says, being more, not having more. I'm just going to read one more thing, sorry, <laughs> uh, a passage from my upcoming book, uh, Good Morning Beautiful Business, that will be published by Chelsea Green this fall. At its heart, the movement for local living economies is about love, and it's love that can overcome the fear that many may feel in the hard days ahead as we face climate change, resource depletion, and environmental decline. In my own experience, it was my love for animals that motivated me to challenge the factory farm system and begin building a local living economy in my region. Our power comes from protecting what we love, love of place, love of life, people, animals, nature, all of life on our beautiful planet Earth. And I would say for the entrepreneurs amongst us, it's also about a love of business. Business has been corrupted as an instrument of greed rather than one of service to the common good. Yet we know that business is beautiful when we produce a product or service needed by our community. Our materialistic society has desensitized us to the suffering that underlies our industrial economic system. 
We're also desensitized by a false idea of masculinity based on control and domination over other people and nature. We need a more feminine, nurturing approach to life to bring forth the goddess in each of us, men and women both, reconnecting with each other, bringing care and compassion to our economy, and trust and harmony to our world. We must open our hearts and eyes and ears to hear the cry of the pigs in the crates, of a cow for her calf, of dog, dogs and monkeys in testing laboratories, of animals in the fur industry, to feel the suffering of men, women, and children enslaved in sweatshops, in the rug industry, in diamond and coal mines, and in chocolate production, the suffering of migrant workers in slaughterhouses and pesticide-soaked industrial farms, the suffering of the people of Iraq, of Nigeria, of the rainforest tribes, everywhere where there is oil and natural resources to exploit and fight wars over. Let us feel in our hearts the loss of whales, of honeybees, of polar bears, of the coral reefs, gorillas, and songbirds. We're all relatives sharing our home on planet Earth. What provides the energy and passion for all we must do in this movement is simply to love and protect what we truly care about, and in so doing, find our place as humans in the family of life. Thank you. Thank you.